Yeah, thank you very much. And also, thank you very much for giving me for agreeing to support with me that uh, um, the talk today is going to be uh, quite speculative that uh, I'm not going to talk about very concrete methods, but this is actually probably nice because later on, Gazini is going to talk about some very concrete methods that maybe have some positive answer uh, to this question. Okay, so yeah, so just one thing to say that here is um, uh, I've been working on science uh, methods in machine learning for quite some time, but uh, most of the work that we are going to mention today, they are mostly uh, uh, with collaboration with Wong who is currently at the Microsoft Research Cambridge. So first I want to say a little bit about why I am interested in this uh, uh, science method. So um, uh, my background is basically machine learning, and I'm always interested in building generative models. And you probably already know that currently uh, generative AI uh, is uh, very uh, hot at the moment. So this is actually uh, what you can get uh, for state-of-the-art uh, generative models right now. I think this was like last year, a uh, sort of like, you know, um, creation uh, between a uh, AI, I think it's Journey, and also a artist on this uh, nice um, uh, image that actually won a uh, competition uh, in the US. So yeah, so but that's basically the how good the quality is right now for generative models. Okay, so yeah, so um, I work on generative models. I want to build um generative models to be able to generate things that looks like this. Okay, but let's go back in a few years, let's say five years before this uh, generative AI boom, and then just consider at that time what we are actually thinking about. So um, around 2017, 18 ish, at that time, generative adversarial neural networks or GANs are still were still popular. <laughs> right now, it is still popular, but uh, yeah, at that time, it was the uh, most popular generative models, and you know that um, the idea for training uh, GANs is basically you have two neural networks. One is the generator, another is the discriminator that you let these two neural networks fight with each other. So the reason why you need these two neural networks to fight with each other is basically uh, GANs, at least the original formulation, what they are trying to do is they want to minimize what is called uh, Janssen channel divergence, but the agility model has no tradable density, okay? So they cannot directly compute the um, Janssen channel divergence to train this generative model, okay? So what GAN actually um, tried to propose to solve this problem is what I called a uh, loss approximation, okay? So you imagine this uh, blue curve is the uh, Janssen channel divergence you want to actually optimize. So as I said, uh, GAN generators has no density form, so you cannot compute it. What they uh, um, do here is uh, you first find a approximate uh, objective, which is defined by this uh, minimized problem, and then use your discriminator to help you somehow appro approximately compute the uh, actual objective you want. And then you're going to uh, do brain descent to train your genetic model using this approximate objective. So yeah, at that time, I was thinking, okay, so this is a, uh, this sounds like a good approach, but you know, uh, doing loss of approximation is definitely a problem to like, uh, say, errors. For example, if you have a very powerful discriminator, then perhaps your approximation will look very wiggly. That creates some sort of like a uh, local minima that is actually not the local minima of the original loss function you want to optimize. Okay. So, yeah. And then th that time I thought, okay, why not just do something a bit more direct? Because we do green descent. Green descent is the uh, number one powerful tool in deep learning. So the idea is the following, okay? So instead of doing loss approximation and then you differentiate through the loss to optimize, then why not just try to figure out how you can directly approximate the gradient of the loss function and then follow that approximate gradient. So at that time, I thought the advantage is basically, okay, so because you are using gradient descent to propose updates for your current location, you only care about the, uh, the quality of gradient at that particular location. You don't need to worry about all the other locations. Okay, so that somehow uh, mitigates this problem of uh, having some weekly looking approximation loss function at the other locations. Okay, so yeah, that uh, was a little idea, but actually how do we, are we going to do this? Well, I mean, at that time I was also interested in version inference and um, we uh, wanted to basically use a GAN-like generator as our Q distribution 
to form the uh, proxy posterior. Okay, so you can definitely plug in this uh, Q distribution to the uh, bachelor lower bound, but you can probably see the bachelor lower bound needs evaluation of the Q distribution. And again, Q distribution has integral density. You cannot do it. But following our previous spirit in terms of just doing direct gradient approximation, then we can say, okay, how do we actually derive, derive the gradient and see what happens? So um, you don't need to worry about the details, but at the end of the day, what happens is um, the gradient you need to compute that involves the Q uh, distribution is the very first term here, okay? And if you assume you have a uh, differentiable neural network like to generate samples, then you can definitely apply chain rule, right? The chain rule tells you that you first want to get the score function of the Q distribution, and then you apply the chain rule through the neural network to, uh, to the update. So this is where you see the score function appears. Okay, so uh, basically the rest of the story is try to figure out how to actually approximate this score function. And probably you will see a lot of score function today. Okay, so the goal is to approximate the uh, score function. And at that time, I was thinking about, okay, how can we actually uh, approximate that in a very efficient way? Because uh, I don't want to actually involve too much, uh, say, uh, effort, let's say, putting a neural network to do it. But it turns out right now, the uh, diffusion models are actually doing neural network approximation to the score function. I wasn't naive. But <laughs> uh, let's just go with this, okay? So uh, at that time, I came across this very nice, formulation called science identity that involves the score function I want and some other test function H. Okay, so science identity tells you that um, if your uh, test function H satisfies some condition, okay, then this identity holds. Okay, so I thought I, I look at this identity and then uh, saw that, okay, I have this score function in this identity that is the thing I want. Can I actually try to somehow extract this uh, score function from this identity, right? So the idea is basically trying to invert uh, this fine identity. Okay, how do we do that? So first, let's think about how we actually compute this identity in practice, which is a simple Monte Carlo. Okay, I'm going to get some uh, samples from the Q distribution and then compute uh, uh, this uh, science identity and move around some terms. And this gives me uh, this uh, equation here. Okay, so. Then uh, what I did later on is uh, basically try to rewrite this uh, Monte Carlo approximation um, equation by using matrices. So I collect all of these uh, score functions uh, evaluated at the samples x1 to xk into a G matrix. And then I basically just uh, you know, uh, formalize other vector things, collect all of them into a matrix, okay? So at the end of the day, what I've done this is I have got this amazing linear equation out. And when you see this linear thing and you're trying to get this uh, G matrix, the very first thing that people might have thought about is linear regression. Okay, so that is essentially why I did. Okay, so um, we are, I'm basically saying that, okay, I want to use uh, rigid regression, actually a regularized version of uh, linear regression to uh, solve this uh, G matrix, which contains all these scores I want at the uh, Monte Carlo sample locations. Okay, so um, yeah, so you basically just work out the uh, uh, solution using uh, this linear regression uh, 101 knowledge. And then this gives you some analytic solutions that actually uh, requires you to compute the inner product between these H functions. And remember the H uh, matrices contains test functions and you want to compute the inner product between test functions. So this naturally gives you a kernel, okay? So you can probably see uh, how this uh, kernel things is going to kick in. And uh, at that time, I was uh, actually very uh, excited about this. And then I thought, okay, so uh, it, it seems so simple. Can we actually have some justification on that? And it turns out, yes. So um, another line of work also um, coming from the you know, colleagues uh, like Arthur Gretzman's group uh, here at UCL, uh, they uh, work on these things called kernelized time discrepancy, okay, which tries to measure the uh, difference between two distributions. And the way you can measure that is you just need samples from the Q distributions and you need the uh, score from the P distribution. 
Okay, so that's the uh, sign, um, colonized sign discrepancy. Well, when I say colonized, it actually means that your test function is actually going to be within the uh, unit ball of a uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay, so yeah, so I looked at this uh, colonized sign discrepancy and I thought about uh, Monte Carlo estimation, and it turns out that uh, the Monte Carlo estimation of uh, estimator of this KSD actually has some nice forms that also relates to the solution of my previous linear regression problem. Okay, so what this tells you is that the uh, previous naive, uh, or somehow naive, uh, estimation method is actually a uh, sort of like a non-parametric uh, estimator derived by minimizing a kernelized sign discrepancy or a regularized version of uh, kernelized sign discrepancy. Okay, so this is nice, but does it work? Right, just remember that my ultimate goal is to train journey models. Okay, so that's uh, so I tried something out. I mean, I tried something in the original paper, but this was another uh submission at uh, a, a Near East workshop uh back in the six years ago. Okay, so the idea is again, I want to train a uh GAN like generator where you just push a uh low dimensional uh runner noise through a big neural network to generate images. So in that sense, this generator also has uh, intractable density, okay? So the way I did that is by minimizing uh, the reverse KL, not the maximum likelihood one, but uh, I worked out how to actually uh, approximate the gradient of uh, this KL term with respect to the uh, general human parameter theta, and that actually involves this uh, sign gradient estimate, okay? So, this is the result back in um, six years ago. Okay, so bear with me. So I also tried out just, you know, by uh, minimizing the uh, MMD, uh, maximum mean uh, uh, discrepancy, uh, distance, uh, distance uh, to train this uh, peak distribution. And at that time I was using this um, uh, RBF kernel directly in the pixel space. And we'll come back to this point later. But what you can see here is that um, uh, at least on this small scale experiment, it seems to be working okay-ish. Okay, so this is the generated uh, images and also these are the two results where the first uh, column there is higher is better than this inception score. And also the uh, second column is like uh, lower is better talking something about the diversity. So roughly speaking, uh, I would say that uh, this approach works maybe slightly better than minimizing um, MND, right? But um, I, I, think I, I thought that this was uh, quite uh, promising in terms of showing the uh, potential of applying this uh, science uh, uh, method and the relevant approaches to general modeling. Okay, so that was six years ago. So now maybe let's just far, go fast forward to what is um, happening now. But before that, let's just look at this. Okay, so um, I show you very two interesting paths in terms of how this field in this score-based uh, uh, general models or score-based methods evolve. Okay, so um, I uh, finished my uh, science uh, gradient estimator work around 2017, and at that time, I, I in the summer, I went back to China for holiday and then I visited Tsinghua. So, uh, and then I met a very talented PhD student, Jia Xinshi. So, who is currently actually now here in uh, DeepMind here. So, uh, you should definitely chat with him. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, we had some nice discussion and then he continued on this line of work and have this uh, special version of Stein Green Estimator around 2018. And then at that time, he also attracted interest from Yang Song. Okay. To work on this. Okay. So, now you can see something diverging happened. Okay, so um, the spectral uh, Stein really estimator is still based on this size uh, Stein uh, discrepancy at the kernel saying, and they are doing this kind of say uh, uh, Nistrom approximation to the kernel um, methods to actually uh, come get a more, so to say, uh, a better estimation from this science method. But then I think at that time they found that okay, I want we want to do something like more direct, which is following this feature divergence and denoising uh, a score matching line of work. So they've got this slice score matching, okay, and also this noise conditional score network. Okay, so you can see that the path is diverging here. 
And uh, around 2020, you got this uh, the uh, uh, DDPN thing out. And 2021, you have got this uh, SD framework for these uh, methods. And in particular, in this uh, uh, 2021 work, uh, Yang Song still used the slice score matching method to estimate the score function. Okay, so they are not using the uh, slice method line of work. So if you go to the other kind of uh, arrow here, so the notable progress here is like 2020 that uh, Will, uh, Will Graf Will uh, got this work on learning time discrepancy where instead of using uh, kernels to define the test function, um, they try to use a neural network to define the test function, okay? And then interestingly, uh, on this line of geometry models, um, uh, at least on image domain, right? So I haven't been able to find uh, significant work, okay, along, uh, along this direction. If you know, then you should definitely let me know, okay? But at least I uh, couldn't find it, okay? But you probably see that on the other arrow that uh, a lot of things have happened and leads to this uh, uh, um, excitement about generative AI, at least in the image domain. So let's just have a, a feeling about what's the gap, right? Um, maybe not right now, maybe let's say even in 2020. Okay, so uh, basically the, um, on the science method line of work, most of the time when they are applied to uh, genetic models, they are applied as sort of like the Q distribution in version autoencoders, trying to enrich the flexibility of the Q distribution. And this, kind of images was what um, they can get around 2020, okay? But uh, 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 already around 2020 uh, in DDPN line of work, the uh, image generation result on this other line is already like this, okay? You pretty much see there is a um, quite significant gap between these two approaches or these two lines of work. Okay. So then basically, um, I think this is a very intriguing uh, kind of uh, intuitive observations and also seeing this involvement uh, uh, of work in this domain, but these two different dimensions. So uh, it naturally leads to a question about whether, you know, science method, basically this uh, gray arrow line of work will ever be successful in terms of that training uh, generative models for let's say images or videos, okay? So let me make sure that I have the right definition about what I meant by uh, work, okay? So I think from my current observation and also maybe from a lot of uh, internal evidence, you can pretty much see that uh, um, when you increase the size of the uh, training dataset and also the model size, then roughly you can see that all kinds of generative models like BAE scans or normalizing flows or diffusion models, they all have improved results. In terms of uh, quality, when you say quality, you can define it. Now we define it vaguely, but you can roughly say, as say, sharpness of the image, uh, diversity of the image, and also some other kind of nice properties like uh, representation. Okay. So the question um, here about work, working or not, it's not about whether, uh, say, you can get some get to some very nice uh, stage when you have a lot of data. I have a lot of, uh, say, a lot of parameters in your model. It's rather the scaling curve. So the question we want to actually ask here is, if you were to uh, bet, like uh, training genetic models with science method, then which curve, this kind of, say, the scaling, uh, which kind of scaling law that uh, this uh, science method will follow? So um, in this uh, stage right now for this uh, genetic modeling, we actually want to see a model working in terms of like this scaling curve, okay? If you have a uh, GIT model that can scale, but it scales like this, okay? It won't be that efficient. And uh, this won't be, uh, say, uh, uh, very attractive for practitioners in practice. Okay, so the question here is really with, uh, which one corresponds to like uh, genetic models trained using science methods or relevant approaches? That, that's the question that I really don't know. And I think this is a uh, research question that perhaps the, uh, uh, at least in the image generation domain, the community uh, doesn't know either. Okay, so 
I think in the rest of the time, I'm going to speculate a bit about uh, why science method hasn't been working well yet. Okay, because as I said, I don't actually know the answer for this question. Maybe we will know that in a few years. Okay, but let's just see what actually made uh, this uh, uh, feature divergence uh, line of work and also the non co matching line of work successful. Okay, and then compare. So basically, um, the idea of score based GRT models is that uh, you have a data distribution that you don't actually know, right? And then you actually um, you want to train a model on this. So instead of training a density model, you want to actually train a neural network that tries to capture the score of the data distribution. And then later on, following uh, uh, some kind of uh, MCMC methods like Langer dynamics to a sample from this uh, score-based model. Okay, so how do you actually learn the uh, score for the data, right? So the very starting point is basically trying to minimize the L2 error between the uh, ground truth data score and also your uh, score estimator. But for sure, you don't actually know the uh, score of the ground truth data distribution. You need some way to mitigate that, okay? So let's talk about this, okay? So the idea of the noise and score matching is basically I'm going to add in some noise to the data distribution that of course is moving approximation and then you try to denoise uh, from it and uh, some very nice piece of math actually show that this denoising procedure can lead uh, you to a, a score estimator of uh, the uh, original uh, data distribution okay and then the other thing that uh, people try here is instead of using only say one level of noise they actually use multiple level of noise okay trying to somehow make your uh, data distribution um, uh, diffuse to somewhere very close to a Gaussian and then uh, go backwards. So these are the two steps that leads to the success of uh, diffusion models. And you know that uh, people have also showed the connections between the uh, uh, diffusion models and the score of the HGNT model, right? So let's just look at another part, okay? So going back to the original L2 error, uh, of uh, score matching, we want to um, um, solve the problem of intractable data score. So we apply the idea called integration by parts. Okay, so, uh, and in particular, um, depending on how we actually apply it, it actually split into two ways. So um, the feature divergence there, you can think about it uh, as uh, just uh, applying integration by parts uh, directly to this L2 error. Uh, term. Okay, you got the feature divergence and then um, the slide score matching, which was used in this 2021 SD framework paper, um, is kind of like a slicing technique that uh, try to efficiently uh, minimize the um, feature divergence in high dimensions. Okay. So again, so they've got this, uh, um, say, more efficient estimator of uh, scores. And again, they still need to solve the problem about, let's say, adding uh, multiple uh, noise level thing, and they leads to the same result. Okay. So um, I hope this gives you a bit of idea about how the other line of work has been evolving to lead to the uh, success in image generation. So now let's ask some questions around this assigned discrepancy world. Okay, so um, yeah, it is still uh, going from uh, say uh, integration by parts, but the way they actually do it here is you actually need to introduce a, an extra kind of set of uh, complexity, which is test functions. And depending on which kind of test function you're using, if you're using a uh, test function defined uh, as say uh, functions in a uniball of IKHS, then you get a kernelized discrepancy. If you use neural networks, then you get this uh, large sign discrepancy in uh, that I mentioned before. Okay, so you can actually then ask the question about what's going on there. Okay, but before that, let's just talk about the successful ideas one by one. Okay, and then see whether those ideas can be applied to sign discrepancy. Okay, so the first um thing that the first issue that they have all in common is basically uh estimation of a very high dimensional uh function okay so score function is a rd to rd mapping 
and it tells you that if you're going to have your uh, data in high dimensions, like above 100, which is typically the case in image world, okay, even in CIMA 10, uh, the image size is like 32 by 32 by 3. Okay, so it's definitely very high here. So you will have some issues in terms of uh, um, estimating uh, these uh, score function. So the idea here is to do something called uh, slicing. And that's basically what I told you about the very first step that uh, 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 goes from feature divergence to this slice uh, score matching world. So let's see how this idea can be applied to uh, science determinacy. So uh, let's just look at sign discrepancy. I noticed that probably this is the first time that you see uh, sign discrepancy today. So the, you can still see the sign operator inside the expectation, but the idea here is you want to actually compute uh, discrepancy by finding sort of like the best uh, test function that can somehow tell you the difference. So when I said it tells you the difference, it is this thing, right? If you uh, put, uh, this uh, test function class as L2 integral functions, then you can actually show the optimal test function gives you the difference between the score of P and the score of Q. Okay, so this is a known result, but again, optimizing this thing is uh, challenging in the high dimensions. So if you set F uh, as the functions in a uniball open architectures, then I think you have a pretty much similar uh, uh, intuition there, but again, you still have a question about kernel choice. So yeah, uh, quite uh, interesting, right? So in this case, uh, in these two publications we have, we are mainly focusing on the problem of trying to uh, address this uh, difficulty of learning RD to RD mapping. So the idea we are going to describe in a few minutes here is basically we want to uh, learn a R to R mapping instead. Okay, and at the same time, it still describes some valid uh, discrepancies that we can use that to do uh, something interesting like uh, doing some speed tests or learning generative models. Okay, so let's see how it works. So let's just uh, look at uh, uh, the first idea. So Remember that we have a RD to RD mapping. So the first part is trying to reduce it from uh, RD to RD to RD to R mapping. So if you look at the optimal test function here, then it tells you the difference between the two score functions. And this is visualized here in the uh, green uh, dash arrow under the, uh, 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 the usual uh, basis uh, in RD, okay? So the first thing you notice here is that you can definitely change the coordinate system. <laughs> right to some other uh, orthogonal basis, right? That it can still represent the difference between these two score function by projecting it to another coordinate uh, uh, system. And in particular, if uh, these two score functions are not equal, then you can actually find just one direction that tells you they are different on that direction, right? So. At the end of the day, what it tells you that is as long as these two uh, uh, distributions are, are different, right, then you should be able to find uh, one direction in this RD space so that the projection of these different uh, vector on that direction is non-zero. So you can still directly just test it, okay? So this is the idea of uh, changing the coordinate system and then just focusing on one direction. And remember, previously we said that uh, this uh, difference between two scores uh, is the optimal test function when you are using L2 integral functions. So then let's just change it, right? So, so this is just changing uh, the uh, difference into the supreme problem. So you have the same procedure here. Here we are just changing the uh, coordinate system. You can still solve this problem. And you can, we can actually show that the solution of uh, uh, this um, um, test function is still, it, it still describes uh, the difference of these two score functions along that direction. Remember, and you can see that we have a local diversity here. And the last part here is basically we said we only need one direction. Then you just pick one direction, okay? So this is the first idea that, uh, uh, reduce the requirement of test function from a mapping of RD to RD to a mapping of RD to R. Okay, makes the problem a little bit easier. 
So the second step is what we call uh, the radon transformation uh, step. Okay, so you can imagine this radon uh, radon transform that works like uh, CT scans. Okay, so in some sense you kind of fire an X-ray uh, towards uh, this direction. Okay. Uh, to basically look at just one slice of this uh, projected function on that direction, and this will describe the uh, uh, function uh, behavior on that direction. Okay, so if you do that for all these kind of different directions, right, that you basically gives you these projections projections around different uh, directions, and you can use all these different projections to reconstruct the original function. Okay. So you can basically see this is how we can bring down from uh, RD to R function to a R to R function, right? And in particular, uh, you only need the best direction that tells you the difference. So the, essentially, as long as uh, um, the, uh, just imagine this function is kind of sort of like the uh, uh, difference between the two score functions. So as long as you can uh, project it to one direction that shows you some difference, then you're done. Okay. So you can basically see that applying these two ideas uh, help us to reduce the requirement of learning a test function from RD to RD to a function of R to R. Okay. So in the first uh, publication of this paper, we actually tried to figure out the supreme of uh, this thing. But actually, we found that uh, even doing some uh, random slices and then later on do some smart optimization can also work very well. OK, so as I said, so I'm interested in journey models. And uh, especially in this case, we want to solve the problem of high dimensionality. And in this case, so this is not a general model in image space, but it is a, a small experiment process on this. So imagine you have uh, a uh, ICA model that uh, looks like this. Okay, so I, uh, ICA uh, process here also gives you, you know, uh, you basically sample a uh, different variable from a lab, uh, Laplace distribution, and then you apply an invertible transformation. So definitely you will have some normalizing constants there. Okay, so uh, the idea here is to train a um, score-based generation model to um, approximate this ground truth ICA generation process. Okay, and then we're going to evaluate this uh, with a log likelihood on test data. Okay, so this is what happens. So the table actually here shows the log likelihood, and the figures here shows the uh, negative log likelihood. So I apologize for a little bit of complicated thing here. But uh, the uh, general takeaway here is first, if you naively apply KSD with, uh, say, RBF kernel in this high dimensional space, it doesn't work. You need some uh, other test functions. And in particular, we can show that uh, our approach. Uh, works uh, quite well on par with uh, this learned Stein discrepancy. And remember that in the learned Stein discrepancy, you actually need a neural network to, to uh, parameterize this RD to RD function. Okay, so this is quite nice. So if you look at the learning curve, okay, in terms of how fast uh, this model train, right? So you pretty much see that when you have a high dimensional problem, the uh, KSD approach pretty much quickly uh, saturates. Uh, doesn't go anywhere. And then uh, our approach can learn a bit faster compared to like uh, the learned Stein discrepancy, which is quite nice. Okay, so this is the uh, solution for uh, like slicing part. Okay, so in particular, you can also go from sort of like a slight discrepancy to uh, Diffusion score uh, matching or diffusion science discrepancy, which is actually using local coordinate system. And we actually so, show some connections to normalization non flows. If you're interested, you can uh, take it out. Okay, so the second uh, issue here is basically disconnecting mode. So the problem that uh, this paper figured out is a uh, when you have a uh, very disconnected modes like this uh, mixture of two Gaussians when your two Gaussians are uh, very uh, you know have a, a long distance from each other, then it is very difficult to directly use the original uh, uh, mixture of Gaussian distribution to estimate 
uh, the score and also estimate the uh, mixture uh, uh, time pi here. Okay, so the idea here is to apply a uh, noise, noise level. Okay, so you're going to add in uh, a lot of noise to uh, this uh, data distribution and then run the uh, um, score there and then try to and then try to figure out how to go back. Okay, so this is some ideas actually from UCL here that they try this idea. Okay, so they first try to compute the KSD between the noise DQ distribution and also uh, the uh, P distribution. So uh, the idea here is if you uh, look at this figure, it basically tells you uh, that uh, this figure uh, says, KSD between the noise distribution and the noise list distribution, uh, distribution Q is not that different from the KSD between the noise distribution and the P distribution. Okay, so where you can see this P distribution has one more mode here. Okay, so it seems that uh, adding noise uh, is not uh, working that well. So this guy is basically just adding this temp tempering idea. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. So, but uh, if you're interested in, you should actually look at this paper. Okay, so we also have some interesting idea around uh, using uh, denoising uh, autoencoder objective where, so this is the denoising autoencoder objective derived in the original paper. And you can think about it as adding some noise uh, that moves your data point away from the manifold and then you try to learn a function to the denoise back. Okay, so the interesting thing here is what we actually show here is via some variations, okay, we can actually try to do this, say, a so, uh, solution of uh, denoting autoencoders in RQHS space, and you can actually show that the functional gradient of denoting autoencoder objective, okay, uh, and the norm of it is actually related to KSD. Okay, so this is some unpublished results. Uh, but the interesting point here is that uh, uh, there are some connections between uh, KSD and also this uh, strategy of adding Gaussian noise, right? So KSD can actually capture the uh, RKH norm of the functional gradient for uh, this denoting autoencoder objective. So there was some interesting discussion already around in terms of like whether you actually want to minimize the original objective using gradient descent, or you want to minimize the norm of the gradient. They are basically trying to find you no know, uh, fixed point, right, for the same objective, but I think the optimization behavior can be a little bit different. So if minimizing KSD is difficult, then maybe just go for the original uh, formulation and do this functional gradient there. Okay, so uh, I apologize for a little bit rush in terms of these two uh, things, uh, strategies, adding noise and slicing, but essentially you can see that in this uh, spine discrepancy world, right? We all more or less have some solutions around these uh, two common issues shared together with uh, feature divergence and also denoting among others. So the interesting question here is, okay, is that already enough? Can we just start and really apply what uh, we know on this line of work? Uh, to uh, say uh, training changing models with uh, some heavy engineering and then make it work. Okay, so I think the big question we still need to answer is to find a suitable test function. Okay, so this is something specific to sign discrepancy either in this uh, kernel world or in neural network test function world. Okay, so one of the problems that people complain about kernel methods is basically a kernels does not work uh, in high dimensions. So the solution people have thought about is, okay, let's try to merge the uh, power of kernel methods and deep learning and do deep kernel. So deep kernel is essentially you use a neural network to extract features of your input and then you uh, impose a kernel on uh, the uh, features. Okay, so it tells you that uh, instead of using a simple kernel in KSD, which solves the supremum problem directly, you actually also want to introduce back this minimax problem by um, trying to optimize the features for the uh, kernel. 
So people have tried that actually because this problem also exists in MMD. Okay, so this is the uh, result from MMD GAN uh, back in a few years ago. So I would say it looks better than the previously shown results, but you probably see that there are still a very weakly kind of uh, uh, artifact here, uh, still very far away from diffusion models. Okay, so you might think that, okay, so this might be the problem of this uh, minimax training procedure, adversarial training procedure that introduced uh, this uh, weird behavior. Then you can actually ask whether there are some tricks in the uh, GAN world that can be transferred to uh, this world of, uh, say, uh, KSD with uh, deep kernels. So there are a lot of tricks developed in the GAN uh, literature, right? I personally think that this regularizing the norm thing and also uh, neural network normalization layers, this thing is uh, uh, transferable to the uh, uh, KSD world, but label smoothing I don't know, okay. Uh, design for learning rate, I think you need to de redesign it again. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much. So I basically uh, described to you about what is the current state, uh, status of uh, science method and uh, their um, siblings, uh, diffusion models, okay. And uh, the ultimate question I want to answer is basically which generator corresponds to uh, the model trade with science method. So we don't know the answer yet, but I've got a uh, MRS student to actually help me answer this question. So hopefully uh, next year, I can give you some answers on this, either positive or negative. Any questions? Sacrificing something for the computational efficiency, or it is completely free. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. So I completely agree with you. The reason why we want to do slicing is we want to make it fast. Okay. So uh, now, in hindsight, in hindsight, and also including my very first development of this fine grained estimator, I kind of underestimate the power of neural networks and the sort of like the uh, determination that people will are willing to spend compute on these gigantic neural networks. So it probably means that I think it might be actually a good time to revisit this learn Stein deterrency idea that uh, they are actually more expensive for sure, right? <laughs> it's actually uh, uh, very expensive because you need to learn this goal function, which is RD to RD. And at the same time, you also need to learn this uh, uh, neural network test function also RD to RD. So <laughs> uh, it's also very challenging, but um, um, yeah. So the, there is this mindset, mindset shift. So probably let, let me just test this with this MS student. <laughs> Um, so KSD is a valid algorithm, so I test it all together by the model of public distribution, but then there's no connection in the L part to the data because this is just a model that is widely distributed. And the random uh, noise level goes to zero, so it's the one connection from the first time. So I'm just wondering like if you have any limitations on the connection. Right. Okay. So I completely agree with you that um, uh, you have this uh, gap when you have say uh, non zero variance noise and in fact you know the uh, ucl colleagues they propose these kind of say uh, um, noisy tempered ksd they are not sort of like uh but strictly speaking valid divergence however if you go to the GRT modeling world the uh, most important thing that people actually want to solve here is to go from a completely uh, random just noise image to something that contains interesting structure. So I think what is happening here is that people is ha are happy with, say, denoising from the uh, Gaussian distribution to a distribution that is very, very close to the end, but still not exactly the data distribution. 
But then later on, add in one more step to basically jump from that uh, uh, very, very similar, very, very, very close to the end distribution to the data distribution via some deterministic step. Okay, so this is what is happening in uh, deep vision models. They always have this very last step. So I'm going to use my uh, capacity of chair to ask a question as well. I was wondering if we go back to your graph with the various systems. Uh, so it's more of a comment than a question. So I think it's on page 10. But I think uh, this this kind of uh, kind of split here, I, I'm I'm personally not so convinced in the okay. sense that um, I think you can show that uh, well, it's been shown in the literature that essentially Fisher divergence is fine discrepancy with L2 test functions. Yeah, so yes. You could make the link like this and then say that's <laughs> fine, it's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good on the yes, 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 yes. I completely agree with you that uh, with L2 test functions and uh, fine discrepancy is actually a uh, uh, feature divergence. Right. The interesting question here is what would this extra flexibility of tests of say more bigger set of test functions actually brings to you in terms of journey modeling field, right? So uh, I think um, you, you can probably tell me and also many people can tell me that uh, you will bring a lot of advantages in sort of like testing and some other cases. So the question, I think essentially what uh, we need to answer on the journey modeling field is, okay, what can we take advantage of this extra flexibility? What uh, if we are successful in terms of training a genetic model on this? What would be sort of like some we have to have some extra nice properties of the genetic models here compared to like the genetic models there, right? Due to the difference of the test function we are using. So, so I think that the L3 test function would be a bigger class than this, right? So I guess it's just a stronger distance, and then there's like the computational trade-off. I guess given the theme of the work. Yeah, but you know, like uh. I think in GANs, right, uh, introducing structure and some inductive bias in your discriminator and can actually help, right? So, uh, yeah, people actually dis design discriminators uh, to incorporate some sort of say nice, say, uh, side problems they want to solve, right? So it's essentially you want, you need a very good test function. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>